Last week we had Stephen Esther Upple with us. And if you if you haven't if you weren't here, weren't able to be here, you haven't heard that, I want to encourage you to just go on the website, kingdomfaith.com, go on the menu, click podcasts, and you'll find last week's message there. I want to encourage you to listen to it. They there were some encouraging things they said at the beginning. Uh, the two of them just sharing some things they sensed God was saying to who we are as kingdom of faith. One of the things that Esther said was in the worship, she was reminded of the, the picture where Jesus sent the disciples to collect the cult to then who was going to then carry Jesus into Jerusalem. And when they untied the colt, they were told to say to the people, if they asked you, what, why do you want it? And they were to say, because, someone, because he has need of it. And she felt God was saying that for us, um, God has need of us as kingdom faith. She was saying various other things with that. And Steve also kind of connecting with that also said that the time that we're just in the beginning of is the very reason that Kingdom Faith was in existence for. And even though we've had many decades of fruitful ministry and everything that God's done in the history of Kingdom Faith, he had this same sense that you're, you're, you're now coming right to the time of the reason that you, God has brought you into, into being. And that's quite a, a huge thing to say when you think about the history. If you don't know the history, I haven't got time to go into it. Um, but God's done a lot in 40 or 50 years through Pastor Colin, who's now with the Lord, through Kingdom Faith and everything that it's represented in who we are as a people. And in Haggai, it talks about two glories, one in the former house, the second in the latter house. And it says in there that in the latter house, the, the, the latter glory will overtake and surpass the former. And, and that's what God does because God is the glory. And God always moves from one generation to the next. He always wants to increase and go beyond what he's done in one generation. And so... We need to understand that, as we know, God is a generational God and he works generationally. But so when you have, you know, guys like that, they come and encourage us and they say things like that. And if you listen to the next few minutes of the message of what Steve was saying, the importance of being ready now in the day and the hour that we're in. And we're going to look at Ephesians 3. That's the, the, the first half of it. That's where we are at the moment in the autumn, going through the book of Ephesians. I'm going to read some of it, make a couple of comments, but then also just do a very simple kind of overview uh, from Genesis to now, if you like, uh, succinctly, just to help us really understand some things, the importance of what, what God is doing at this moment, but also put into a little bit of context what's happening also in the Middle East. It's so important that we understand the story in here. We understand what God is doing and what God is saying. It's really important that we don't get our narrative of what is happening by watching Sky News, BBC News, GB News, social media, all of those things. It's, we obviously, we need to know what is going on and what is happening because we need to be informed so that we pray. If we don't understand what God is doing and where we are at this point in history, it's very easy to one, get confused, two, start forming opinions from everybody else's opinions and thoughts, three, you'll start falling out with other Christians COVID was a little blip along the way and many people fell out with each other. And what it exposed was the immaturity in the body of Christ. And I'm not being negative here. 
But when you read the story, especially when you get more towards the end into Revelation and you see what starts going on in the earth, it's, it's very, very challenging to your natural mind as to what is going on. And the Bible says, Jesus says himself, that in those days, many, the love of many will grow cold. Now, we're in, some, we're in the beginnings of those days. We already see within the church, because of the conversations going on, about that are really to do with the authority of God and the authority of his word. We see people in the church, leaders in different denominations, debating things and how we need to exalt our wisdom and our opinions and our thoughts above the authority of God and his word. And when we see that, we know that there is a huge lack of the fear of the Lord in the church. And I mean big C church. And we we are part of that whole thing, right? And... It's important to understand that where there's a lack of the fear of the Lord, reverence of God, then we will start filling our ears with other people telling us what our itching ears want to hear, which it talks about in 2 Timothy 4. So we are, we are living in days where, and if there's no fear of the Lord and we start doing that, our own opinions and wisdom above God, then we know that the love of many is already beginning to grow cold. Because if our hearts burned with him and for him, I'm talking generally as the church, right? If our hearts as the church burn for him in the way that he wants to, there would be a fear of the Lord. We wouldn't dare even consider in whatever area of life it is, dare to think that we could exalt ourselves or the word or our opinions over the word of God. And so there there needs to be a humility, a humbling in our own lives and hearts as the church in this nation to humble ourselves afresh before God, to bring ourselves under his lordship in a fresh way. Pastor Colin used to say this, that we cannot make the gospel acceptable to people. But it's the gospel that makes us acceptable to God. So we're living in days and times where if we just look at the natural, at a natural level, we'll form all kinds of opinions and thoughts about what's right, what's wrong and all of that. And there are challenging days ahead. What's going on in the Middle East at this moment is is far beyond anything that's happened in recent history, but it's, it's still a skirmish in relation to what is going to be happening on the earth. Our our Western Christianity doesn't fit a challenging, potentially persecuted type of culture lifestyle. (laughs) Welcome to church this morning. (laughs) It's a bit heavy, Clive, aren't you? Wow, what side of bed did you get out of this morning? (laughs) I believe God wants us to have a little, you know, in our lives at this time as to what is going on, okay? That we don't just form our opinions about what we think is going on in the Middle East or with Israel, what we think they should or shouldn't be doing and, um, and all of that kind of stuff. What is at work in the earth is the spirit of Antichrist. And some of you are going to, oh, he's going to go off the deep end here this morning, flipping (laughs) heck. You see, what is behind anti Semitism is the spirit of Antichrist. What is going on at this moment and in in the Middle East, it's, it's the spirit of Antichrist, really, that's at work. What does that want to do? It's called anti-Semitism in this context. It wants to wipe the Jewish people off the map. 
That's the spirit of anti-Semitism. It's not just a few horrible words towards Jewish people. It's death and destruction. We want to remove them from the face of the planet. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Why is that? Because the devil hates anything connected with God. The devil hates the Jewish people. He hates you and me. He hates everyone. And so he's at work to steal, kill and destroy. What we see at work at the moment when you watch the TV, yes, there's something going on in the natural, but there is a huge spiritual battle that is going on at this this moment, which is playing out things that are in the word. Even more so, we're never ever going to go back to what we used to know normal as being. A very comfortable, peaceable, on the whole, culture, society. Yes, we have a few problems here and there, but life goes on. We like, you know, we, we eat, drink, and be merry, and we're going after this, that, and the other. There's day, the days that we're in, there's, there's no longer time for living like that in the days that we're in. And things are only going to accelerate, and light and dark are only going to become even more obvious. So let's just jump into um, Ephesians 3, otherwise, we're not going to get there. Um, Let's just read this. I'm reading in the, uh, the truth version. This follows on from chapter 2, which obviously chapter 3 would. Um, but Kevin, uh, Pastor Kevin, who leads Burgess Hill, he, he brought a brilliant message a couple of weeks ago, fantastic message, summarising some of what's in chapter 2. And this continues on from what he was uh, speaking about. If you haven't heard that one, again, I encourage you to listen to this. But this is what Paul the Apostle writes here. This is the reason why I, Paul, am happy to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It is for your sake. So what's he saying here? I'm happy to be a prisoner. I'm happy to be locked up in a prison. I'm happy to be here at this moment for your sake. Paul very much lived a life, didn't he, that was, I'm not living for my own sake. I'm living for the sake of Christ Jesus, but I'm also living for the sake of those that know him. And we'll unpack some of this in a minute, but also for the sake of those that don't yet know him. That was the heart and the passion that he he lived with. Verse two, you heard about the way God has given me such grace for your benefit so that I could tell you of the hidden things that have been revealed to me. Now that I'm writing in this way, you'll be able to understand the insight that I've been given into these truths about Christ that remained hidden to those of other generations. So what's he talking about? He's talking about when he was born again, after he was blind, he met Jesus on the road, went blind. Uh, Then God told Ananias, go and find Paul or Saul. And uh, he was blind. He prayed for him. His eyes were opened. Paul was around for a little while, but then God took him away for two or three years where he just revealed everything that we read that Paul has written in the New Testament about everything that Christ has done for us and what it means to have Christ in us and all the revelation that is rich in this book of Ephesians. And what he's talking about is the mystery of what it means to have Christ in us. The mystery of the cross and what Jesus accomplished. The mystery of what it means to have Christ in us and what it means to have uh, and, and us to be in him. And all of that, and that's what he's speaking about here at this moment. Then he says in verse 5, These things have now been revealed by the Spirit to those whom God has raised up as apostles and prophets. God gives revelation to apostles and prophets. They're the foundation of the church. So God gives revelation to those two because the church is built on those foundations. The whole revelation of in Christ Jesus is a foundational truth for the church, for the body of Christ, in which God builds his church on that revelation. Without a revelation of who you are in Christ, what he's done for you, what it means now, the old has gone, the new has come, I'm a new creation. If we don't have that fundamental foundation in our life, it's very, very difficult to become a person of faith. 
because the revelation of who you are in Christ shows you this is who I am now in him. I'm no longer this person over here that was separated from Christ. I am now a new creation in him and it's his life in me that I'm now living in. And because I have him in me, I've now been made acceptable, made worthy. Therefore, I can come boldly and confidently before his throne as a child of God, confidently and boldly to worship, to pray, to know him, to hear from him, to walk with him. Why? Because God's favour, God's face shines on me. His favour is on me as a child of his. Anybody believe that today? And when we have that revelation, the enemy might come and say, oh, you're this, you're that, the other. But then in you says that, yeah, that's who I used to be. But I'm no longer that anymore because of what Jesus has done for me. This is who I am now. And we have to remind ourselves of those truths often every day because you know there's a battle that goes on up here, right? Does anybody else have a battle or is it just me? I'm no exception to this battle that goes on up there, right? We all have this day to day. Even some days, how many of you know some days are worse than others? Right? Some days you're like, what is going on today? You know, and, um, but that's why it's so important that when you get up in the morning, I don't know what you guys do. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do when I'm realising I'm waking up, the first thing I do, I'm like, Father, thank you. I'm, uh, you know, Jesus, morning, hello. How many of you sometimes wake up in the morning and it's not that you don't want to get out of bed because you, you think, oh, I can just do it another few minutes. How many of you sometimes have this? When you wake up in the morning, you do wake up and the first thought in your head is, I don't know if I want a face today, if I'm honest. Does anybody ever get that? Or is it just me? Oh, Clive, I didn't know you had thoughts like that. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes the, the temptation in that moment is to go... Uh, I, I, if I doze off, I can delay that for another few minutes. There's this very real thing that goes on, right? So we know the truth and who he is in us, right? But we still have to take a hold of that because the enemy wants to undermine it. He wants to try and pull the rug out from under our feet. So I know for me in the morning, when I get up and, and it's like, I'm, the, what I'm doing when I get up, go to the bar, you know, have a shower and start, I'm, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you that you love me. I love you. You're wonderful. You're mighty. I don't, I, I'm not like, oh, go make a cup of tea and oh, my knee hurts this morning. <laughs> I could do without that and everything else. It might feel a bit like that, but I'm, I'm purposely, even though, I'm, go back to bed. Just have another 20 minutes. The alarm wasn't going to go off yet and you're getting up. What are you doing, you stupid idiot? You can have another few minutes. And I'm like, no, I want to get into the day and I want to start with, okay, there's a battle that goes on, but I want to win that battle, right? At the beginning. Anyway, there's loads we could say. There's, when we come into Ephesians 4, we're going to talk more about the fivefold ministry and, and all of that. Verse 6, it seems strange that because the gospel... Of the, because of the gospel, those who are not Jews are heirs together with Israel. This is some of the mystery that Paul is unfolding, okay, when he explains in chapter 2 that the, the church, which he comes... Let's read this bit then. It seems strange that because of the gospel, those who are not Jews, which is us, like if, you're a Gen, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So whether you're an Arab, a Palestinian, English, French, whoever you are, right, you're not Jewish, we're Gentiles, okay? Both Jewish and non-Jewish believers in Christ form one body and they share together in the promises given through him. And he goes on to talk about that is the church. It's Jew and Gentile. In Israel, they don't use the word church, partly because the history of the word church has so many negative meanings because of the Crusades and all the persecution they've had through so-called Christianity. They use words like congregations and fellowships and everything because it has different meaning. But in, in terms of the Bible, when God talks about the church, he's talking about this, this mystery of the cross, of what Jesus has done to bring us into relationship with him. He's broken down this wall of hostility, which we heard a couple of weeks ago, this separation between Jew and Gentile. 
and now Jew, believing Jew, and a believing Gentile become one together in Christ. Paul even goes to far as to say that in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm not a male anymore. Let's not go there. There's male and there's female, right? Okay. But what he's basically saying is in Christ, in Christ, first and foremost, you've now become brothers and sisters, sons, children of God. And so you're not first dealt with as a Jew or a Gentile or as a man or a woman or as a slave or as free. You're first looked at as a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God in that sense. And that's why it's so important to have God's understanding of, of what, he's, what he's going on and what he's, he's doing. Then we'll just uh, read this. God called me to be a servant, verse 7, of this gospel and gave me his grace so that he would work powerfully through me. I consider myself less than the very lowest of God's people, yet he gave me such grace. He enabled me to preach the gospel to the Gentile nations, telling them of the immense riches of Christ. I have been able to explain to everyone those things that formerly remained hidden in the purposes of God who created everything. His plan has always been that now his great wisdom should be revealed through the church, Jew and Gentile. The church in God's mind is Jew and Gentile. Okay? One new man in Christ. Through the church, his people, that the church should declare these truths even to the heavenly rulers and authorities. So Paul is saying here, he's saying there are hidden things, these mysteries that have been revealed that I have been telling you. What does that mean for us then? If the mysteries of God were revealed to him in order for others to understand the mystery of the cross and what Jesus has done, the mystery of how God brings Jew and Gentile together in Christ as the church, he has to tell some of these things he wrote, but when they sent letters out, when they went to a church, it wasn't, this letter would, be, would have been copied and sent to many churches in many places. When they would get there, they would read it out, all the teaching of Paul, they would read it to the people. So even though he wrote it, it's still to tell everyone. Now, in order for people that you and I know that don't know Jesus, in order to understand the mystery of who Jesus is, because for somebody who doesn't know Jesus, he's a mystery. They don't get it. They don't understand it. How many of you know before you came to know Jesus, you didn't understand what it was all about? And maybe half the time you think, I'm still learning what it means. And that's the journey that we're on. The day you got saved, the day you gave your life to Jesus, he put the fullness of who he is in you. And now we're spending the rest of our lives discovering what it means to live in the good of what he did then. Right? Right? And, and helping others to come into that. So in order for others to understand the mystery, we have to tell. We have to share it. Now, this leads very nicely to this moment. Everybody pick up your smiley track that's on your seat for a moment. Okay. We have Eric Casto around for six, seven weeks at the moment. He's in Crawley this morning speaking over there. There was an outreach yesterday in Crawley Town Centre. Loads of people heard the gospel, conversations, people were getting prayed with and prayed for, for different things in different ways. Um, The School of Acts training, how many of you are on that? I know there's about 45, 50 people uh, from the different congregations on that. Every week on a Thursday night during that training, Eric gives each person five of these. And during that week, you have to have some sort of conversation with five different people in some way. Um, And his example of how to do this is simply not necessarily feeling like you have to just share the gospel with everything that you think you know and all of that moment, but just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, if there's someone you want me to talk to or you want me to greet or or anything, then just show me who that is and, and, and what you want me to say. But one of the questions he encourages people to say when you might just have a moment with somebody behind a till or in a, in a, a moment and, and you might think, oh, that's a bit cheesy or, or whatever, but his question, he's, he asked this question. He says, hey, has anybody ever told you how much Jesus loves you? And for most people, they've never heard that. 
And, and in that moment, he might just have a little short conversation, depending on the time, and just say, hey, can I give you one of these? This is just a story, just shows you very briefly how Jesus loves you, right? Now, it's a seed. It's a seed. Sometimes when we talk about sharing the gospel, we think that we have to, in that moment, say everything we think we know, lead them to Jesus, and if we don't, we've failed. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. When they began to follow him, they didn't, know, they, they didn't really know who he was, what he was about, but they began to follow him. How many seeds did they hear that went into their hearts and lives? And how, many, how long did it take down the road before they began to have, hmm, he's, he's, is he the Christ? Is he? And the conversations they had, and then they're like, he is the Christ. Surely if he is, no one apart from the Christ could do these things. So he must be. Jesus didn't mind them having all these questions and all these things on the way. He didn't try and hammer home to them in 30 seconds. If you don't believe me now, you know, you're doomed. You know, he was like, come follow me, follow me, follow me. Just come and spend time with me. Come and be with me. It's like an invitation. And so I want to encourage you over the next week, you have a mystery that is a reality in your life now. You know what Jesus has done. You know how he's saved you, changed you, healed you, whatever he's done. That's part of the mystery. But your story is a real story of who God is in your life. So I want to encourage you in the next week, um, just pray and ask the Lord. Um, He'll, if you ask him, he'll give you an opportunity. And um, I had a bit of an opportunity yesterday. I didn't have one of these on me. In the supermarket, one of our old neighbours just happened to... Jane and I were looking at some food and thing, and we got a nudge on the back and, oh, you know, hello, mate. And a uh, little conversation, and we ended up... It wasn't a deep, like, a, like here you go, here's... I didn't have one of these. Um, but we had a little short conversation, and I, I need to follow that up with what I said to him and what he said to me. And I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it, but suddenly there's a nudge. And in that moment, I'm like, oh, uh, you know, shall I say something? Shall I not? Or whatever. And knowing I should do, yeah. right? Make the most of yeah. every opportunity. And uh, so I just want to encourage you. So I'm going to follow that up with him, the conversation we had. And, and he used to be a neighbour where we used to live. So we've had a few before. And it's like, hmm, be good to pick up on that one. Uh, he said a few things going on in his life at that moment and I thought, hmm, that would be good to have a pray and just come back and, and, and push, kind of talk to him a bit more and see if I can pray for him. It wasn't right to get into that yeah. in that aisle in Sainsbury's. I was like, yeah. probably not some of the things he's talking about, a deeper, meaningful, you know, looking at butter or whatever we were doing <laughs> in that moment. So I want to encourage you. Are you all going to have a go, Yeah. yeah. So when we come next week, the first thing we'll, we'll, at some point we'll do is turn to the person next to you and say, how'd you get on? Is that all right? Yep. Yes. Don't, don't decide to stay at home and watch it on the stream next week, all right, because of that. So, you know, this is good for you. All right, a few minutes. Uh, Kate's going to be speaking next week and doing the next part of this chapter, which talks, goes on a little, I don't know what she's going to say, um, Kate Squires, but there's some stuff about being the family of God in there. Now, in a, in a few minutes, I just want to give a really, really simple overview to the Bible, okay, in about five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it fits in with what we're saying here. What, what I believe God wants us to look at, this mystery. Part of the sharing the gospel is not just what happens here. What, did, what does he say here about the purpose of the church declaring to principalities and powers? You know, when we speak the name of Jesus, when we declare the gospel, when we declare who he is, there's something going on in the spirit. It's not just what you're saying to someone else. Imagine the church mobilised, not just ours, but many churches mobilised, sharing the gospel, speaking about Jesus, 
giving our talk, stories and testimony. This is the church then on the earth declaring to everything out there that we don't necessarily see, declaring Jesus is the Christ. Amen. He is the Saviour. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the one that we're here to proclaim as the church on the earth. Now, really briefly, okay. How many of you know you have God's kingdom in you? Yes. How many of you know that when Jesus came, he came, what did he say? The first things we hear at the beginning of the gospel is I'll repent for the kingdom of, God. kingdom of heaven is at hand, okay? When did that kingdom start? It's never had a beginning. It's always been. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in relationship together, because Jesus is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. When, he, when, he, when they said, teach us how to pray, what did he say? He said, our Father, relationships, Father. If there's a Father, there must be children. Hallowed be your name, reverence, awe, fear of the Lord. Then what did he say? Your kingdom, your will be on as it is in, right, where? On Okay, so Jesus is carrying on something that began on earth in Genesis. Yeah. So God is in his kingdom before anything's created down here. He's in his kingdom, the whole host of heaven worshiping him. It's, going, it's been going on, our minds can't get our heads around this, right? Because it's outside of time. Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven. Isaiah and other places describing the gemstones, the beauty and how, how he looked. At one moment, at some point there in eternity that way, um, he has this thought, I want, every, I want everything in heaven to worship me. At that moment, he was thrown out of heaven. That's when Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. It, there was no pastoral conversation where God said to the Lucifer, do you want to come into my office for a minute? I, I, you had a bit of a thought there, and I, I noticed in the worship you started to sing about yourself and not me. Didn't even get that far. It was a thought in his mind, and boom, he was out. He was thrown down here, right? God brings creation into being. As part of that, he creates mankind. What does he say in Genesis chapter 1? He created them in his image, man and female. Then he says in verse 28 of chapter 1, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the... Okay. Now, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, relational. Yeah. There's a kingdom, his kingdom. His kingdom is a relational kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. His kingdom, as we see here, is a kingdom made up of a family. His family are those that know him and walk with him. Yes. What does he say? He gives them a kingdom mandate in, in Genesis 1.28. He blesses them and be fruitful, increase and fill the earth. Fill the earth with what? Fill the earth with God's glory. Go and take the kingdom, this relational kingdom, and I want you to take it to the ends of the earth. Fill the earth, right? Fill the earth with who? With people, with family. So God's purpose was to fill the earth with a family of people that were in relationship with him so that his kingdom rule and reign could be on earth as it is in heaven, okay? Now, the enemy didn't like the fact that God had... He, who, who, who do those people think they are? What does God think he's doing creating them and giving them dominion over what I think is mine? So he deceives them, they sin, there's separation. And instead of God's glory and kingdom going throughout the earth, instead sin fills the earth. God gets to this, is a real quick summary now, right? Ready? So the earth thing gets full of sin. God gets to the point where he's like, this is not working, I'm going to start again. He finds a man, Noah, who was a righteous man. He says, build an ark. There's a whole other thing here. Build an ark. How long did it take him to build an ark? 100 years. What do you think that was like to hear something from God and spend 100 years building something for something that's coming that you don't understand, but you still do it anyway because God's told you to? We are living in days now 
And God is speaking prophetically to his church to get ready, be ready. We heard last week, love first, seek first, deeply rooted. Why? Because there's stuff coming. There's things going to increase on the earth. If we are not, you'll get blown away by what is going on in the earth. You'll struggle to understand it if we don't know God and we don't know his word, right? God is speaking about getting ready. Everybody in the day thought Noah has lost the plot. He's building an ark in the middle of a desert. What are you doing? The Christian life does not look rational to those that don't know God. But God's speaking to us. Make sure you're ready. Get the ark ready. You, your life is an ark. Make sure your ark is ready. Oh, I'm going, I, I'd like to carry on for ages, but I can't. Um, um, after, after the ark was built, Supernaturally, God brought all the animals there, right? Do you know the, the door of the ark was then open for seven days afterwards before the rain started? Imagine that is God's heart for the people on the earth. He got everything ready and, and he didn't go, right, now the animals, I'm going to get rid of this lot. He's like, Noah, leave it open for seven days because I want a last opportunity. Does anybody want to come and join the ark? This is God's love and God's heart for people. Anyway, they didn't. Flood happened. Other side of the flood. What happens? Noah's sons. I'll have to accelerate. I've got to do this in three minutes, right? So um, the nations come from the sons of Noah. God speaks to Noah and his sons and makes a covenant with him. He says the same thing to Noah as he said to Adam and Eve. He blessed them, be fruitful, increasing number. If you go down to verses 7 and 8, it talks about the covenant he made with Noah more. So he's like, what is he doing? God wants to reestablish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He's going to do it through family. Okay. Um, so didn't deal with the sin issue. So the, <clears throat> the nations come from his sons. Um, the, they decide they want to build a tower. Let's make a name for ourselves. God comes down, confuses them. This is where all the languages come from. They, they then spread out all over the earth, okay? But God loves people. God loves the nations. So what does he do? He raises up somebody called Abraham. And what does he say? Because God loves people, loves the nations. This is before Israel or the Jews were even around. God loves people. God loves the nations, okay? The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, this, that, and the other. He said, I'll make you into a great nation. We know that the nation that came from Abraham was the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, okay? But he also says, I'm going to bless all peoples on earth through you. Why? Because God loves nations. God loves people. But it's all about people. It's about family. When you, so you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, generational. It's family. Each generation got the same promises from the previous one to continue on the purposes of God on earth, okay? God works through family. Jacob has 12 sons. They become the tribes of Israel. When they're in Egypt, that's when they become a nation, Let's jump to kind of run through the Old Testament quickly. When they walked with God, they were blessed and other nations were in fear with them. When they didn't walk with God, they were overrun. They weren't blessed. Okay. In Ezekiel 36, God says, look, it doesn't matter how much they try and follow the law, unless I'm in them, it's not going to happen. So basically in Ezekiel 36 from verses 24 to 28, he says to them, I'm going to deal with this stony heart and I'm going to put a heart of flesh in you. I'm going to take the stony heart out, put one of the, but I'm also going to put my spirit in you so that you can walk in my ways according to my laws, right? According to his word and his ways. And also there's promises about the land in there too. That's why it's important to understand this, okay? Um, oh, I'd like to go somewhere, but I can't. Um, so what is Ezekiel 36? He's prophesying about the Messiah coming. He's prophesying about the cross. He's prophesying about what is going to shift history from where it is to where it needs to be, okay, in terms of mankind. So Jesus comes. It's interesting, the first, the Magi's, when they come to find Jesus, what do they say? Where is the one born king of the Jews? Jews? On the cross, what was the sign over the cross? King of the Jews, Jews, right? So primarily, firstly, Jesus comes first for the, then for the, right. But God loves the 
nations. Why did he want to raise up a people through Abraham? Because he wanted to be, he wanted to show the nations what it's like to be in a people. So the nations like, look what, look what it's like to have God in them, God amongst them, to cause the nation to be jealous. But the people of Israel didn't walk with God in the way that he wanted to. When Jesus died on the cross, he died once and he died for all. all. One of the things in Ephesians 2 that came out a couple of weeks ago is God is not on anybody's side. He's on his own side. He's lining everybody up with him. All right. This is why everybody's talking about sides in the media. Everyone's talking about sides. God is on his own side. The bigger prayer we want to be praying is a revelation of Jesus to the Jewish people as their Messiah and a revelation of Jesus as God to the whole Muslim world. Uh, that's what, that's praying to that. Of course, we want to pray for people to be protected. But the bigger picture is God at work, God moving. Um, what is threading all through this lot? It's family. It's family. It's family. In the church, we're going to close in a minute. In the church, there's been so much focus on the last 15, 20 years about leadership, about models of church, structures, organisations, programmes, all of that. When Jesus, when Jesus came, what was the last thing he said before he went up to heaven? <laughs> Matthew 28, 18 to 20, great commission, right? Go and... Make disciples of all nations. He didn't say, go and run a program. Go and, he didn't, anyway, let's not go there. He didn't say all that stuff. He said, go and make disciples. You see, we're part of a relational kingdom. How many times in the New Testament, especially when you get into the book of Acts, it talks about households of faith, family of believers, all of that stuff, because it's about a family. Why are our homes so important? Because that's where the family is in the home. Yeah. Yes, we're, we're gathered as a family now, but we don't live here. We live in our homes. We live in our streets where we are. Our homes are going to become increasingly important going forward because of what God's doing. Let's just stand up. While you're standing up, I can finish off what I'm saying. Then at least you'll think I'm coming to a close. <laughs> So we're, we're part of a kingdom and we're a kingdom family. It's a relational kingdom first and foremost. But that relational kingdom has a purpose. If, well, not if, God always is about his kingdom. The, the Bible, let's put it this way, this book has primarily become just a story of salvation for mankind. What do I mean by that? Often, when we hear somebody sum up the Bible, they say, God created man in his image to know him. We sinned, and therefore he ultimately then sent Jesus to sort it all out so that we could know him and go to heaven. End of story. Yeah. It's in there. That's part of the storyline. But this book is about God and his kingdom. Amen. It starts with his kingdom in the beginning. I'm going to create some people to work out my kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In order to come into that kingdom, you have to be born again. Salvation is the doorway into the kingdom. Once you're in the kingdom, there's then work to do on earth because we're here to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So salvation is the doorway into the kingdom. Then we become servants of the kingdom. And in the kingdom, there are loads of ambassadors of the kingdom. You and I, every one of us is an ambassador of the kingdom. An ambassador is given authority from the guy in charge to say, you represent this kingdom wherever you go and you have authority to speak in my name, to make decisions in my name, to preach and declare in my name. Why? Because you're an ambassador that's been given authority and the right from the king of that kingdom to do business on his behalf. And he puts his spirit in us to enable us to do it. This is why even just having one of these is part of being an ambassador. I mean, not, not in and of itself, it's a bit of paper, but it's just a little prod for each of us and encouragement. Right, this week, I'm going to say something to someone, share something, give them one of these or, what, or pray for whatever it might be. 
all right? Because we're all on the king's business. Is that right? Yes. Let's just close our eyes for a moment. Bit of a hodgepodge message. Into, no, don't, I'm not asking for a response. So, just close your eyes for a minute. Firstly, just thank the Lord that you're in his kingdom family. Just verbalise that. Thank him that you're an ambassador. You're an ambassador of this kingdom. Just thank him that, that there's work to do and he's called you to be one of those ambassadorial workers for his kingdom purposes. Father, I thank you for fresh grace and anointing for each one of us to live the life you've called us to, to love you first, to seek you first, and to go deeper, as we heard last week, so that we're not blown around by every wind of teaching and doctrine and everything going on in the news, so that we are rooted in you. But Father, I thank you, you would also, that you are the love in us for people. And Father, I thank you, enable us to see one another and all those around our lives, especially those that don't know you. Father, enable us to see them with your eyes so they can become part of this family, your kingdom family on earth. Why is it so important? Because God is the father and he has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. Because everyone can have a direct relationship with him, personal relationship with him. But if he also has sons and daughters in that sense, then they can also have spiritual sons and daughters. And so we're here not to come up with a program and an organisation and a structure and this and that and the other that we all live to. God comes and lives in people. God reproduces his life through people so that every one of us has spiritual sons and daughters. And God has put his DNA in us, which is a reproducing DNA in other people's lives so that you can have spiritual sons and daughters. If you've got kids, they are your natural kids, but they are your first spiritual sons and daughters because of the way we're called to raise them in the the knowledge, the knowing of God and who he is. Not knowledge head, but heart, which is also informed by the head, but that heart relationship. And then we go beyond our families, our kids, and, or, or our wives or husbands, and then we, we reach out to those around us. So, Father, I thank you this week. I don't even, you, we don't even have to ask you to give us opportunities because you're going to give them if we're just available. So, Father, we just say we're available for whatever you want to do this week to have conversations with others so that they can become part of this kingdom family that we are part of. We thank you, Jesus. We praise your awesome name. Amen. Amen.